The Gist is sponsored by Stamps.com. Buy and print official U.S. postage using your own computer and printer and save up to 80% compared to a postage meter. Sign up for a no-risk trial and get a $110 bonus offer when you visit Stamps.com and use the promo code The Gist. It's Monday, October 6th. 2014 from Slate. It's the gist. I'm Mike Pesca. I was away. I was in California for the weekend. A lot happened while I was gone. Actually, news got to California. I mean, it happened while I was gone, but it happened while I was here. I'm going to talk about some guy dying in Florida. That happened just as much in California as it did in New York. It's just that the point is, I took the red eye back, and I'm extremely tired. And one of these things, one of the side effects of being tired is forgetfulness. Like, you could read something six times, and it doesn't stick, or you find yourself in the middle of doing an action, and you don't know what the heck you were doing, and that just happened to me. I was in the middle of something, and I was like, huh, look at that. I stare down, One leg is firmly planted on the floor, and the other is just sort of hovering in midair. And I'm like, what was I doing? Why would I have one leg up like this? Also, my arms were kind of swinging in like this swingy motion. And then it hit me. I knew what I was doing. I was walking. I I was lifting my leg and then trying to bring it down again, an upstroke, downstroke thing. But now I had to figure out, all right, was I on the upstroke or the downstroke? So I looked down, and I noticed my plant leg was in front, and my up leg, the one that was in the air, was a little behind the plant leg. So this means I was lifting off. And so I figured out, what should I do? I should finish the process, and then I put my other leg down and kept repeating it. It it became involuntary after a while, but right in the middle of it, it was very freaky. So what happened while I was away? Well, Baby Doc died. Jean-Claude Baby Doc Duvalier, the formerly repressive, but perhaps more importantly, incompetent dictator of Haiti. He's gone. Baby Doc gone. The whole Baby Doc thing. I know why he was called that. His father was Papa Doc. His father was a real doctor. The kid was just, I mean, he was 19 when he became president. I think. He didn't know what he was doing. He's just a rich kid who was terrible at his job. But I do think the whole Baby Doc, Papa Doc thing was trying to cute him up a little bit, right? Baby Doc was a title invented by cynical journalists, but it did seem to give him a hint of smurfiness, you know, benevolence, maybe even a little wisdom, and he really lacked that. If you want that, if you want to brand yourself as a guy people can trust, don't do the Doc name. Here's what you do. You do what the president of Estonia has done. This guy is alleging that Russia is bullying Estonia and that the Russians have detained an Estonia security agent. The Estonia president is a sympathetic figure because of a few things, like Russia really is a bully and because he could document all the allegations that they've made against Russia, but also because President Tomas Hendrik Ilves wears a bow tie almost all the time. You can't find a picture of a guy without a bow tie. And a guy in a bow tie definitely seems like he's being pushed around by a big bully, a big bully run by a shirtless former KGB agent. That, the bow tie, that sells it, and that's called branding. That's my lesson to you, dead Papa Doc, dead baby Doc. On the show today, my spiel will be from the live show that we just did last night in San Francisco, and why the House of Representatives is fighting with scientists. But first, Qatar, friend, enemy, frenemy. The United States' largest military base in the Middle East is not located in Israel or Saudi Arabia or Jordan. It's in Qatar. The largest voice of the Arab world to the outside does not emanate from the most populous nation in the Middle East, Egypt. It's Al Jazeera. And it's based in Qatar. When the U.S. wants to negotiate with the Taliban or other Islamic extremist groups, it often goes through Qatar. When American journalist and author Peter Theo Curtis was freed by Islamic rebels in Syria, who negotiated that? Qatar. But in order to have this sway with radical elements throughout the world, it means that Qatar has to have dealings with radical elements throughout the world. Should the U.S. consider Qatar a friend, an enemy? a frenemy. Jeremy Shapiro is a fellow in the Brookings Foreign Policy Program, and he joins me to discuss, is Qatar our frenemy? Hello, Jeremy. Hi, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Tell me about the emir, the ruler of uh, Qatar, the ruling uh, family, how they come to power, what are their motivations? Well, the ruling family of Qatar is uh, the Al Thani family, and Qatar is really run pretty much as a family-owned business. There are only about 300,000 uh, citizens in of Qatar, and but there are about 2 million or so guest workers who basically do all the work in the country. Uh, and the 
until oil and gas, mostly gas, was discovered there in the 1970s, it was uh, basically a backwater, basically just a desert. But in the past uh, 30 plus years, it's exploded into a very modern state on the backs of this incredible gas resource, which has made, basically enriched every citizen of the country. It does seem to me that a lot can be explained by the uh, Cuttery Royal family's youth, relative youth. They're the new kid on the block. So not only does that allow them an inroads to undercut the uh, ancient Saudis, which not only have old rulers, but there are so many, you know, princes that do a lot of sharing of the wealth. And also they don't have a history with the Muslim Brotherhood of fearing or thinking of the Muslim Brotherhood as a rival, right? Most of these other Middle Eastern dynasties have feuded and suppressed the Muslim Brotherhood because at one time the Muslim Brotherhood was a threat to them. I think by and large, though, um, they're not really very nervous about the Muslim Brotherhood within Qatar. and They're not very nervous about ideological challenges to their rule at home in part because they're so shockingly rich that uh, their strategy for any time there's any sort of ideological struggle is less about repression and more about co-optation. They will just buy you off. And I would certainly recommend to your listeners as a sort of money-making tactic that if they wanted to form uh, a committee to overthrow the Al Thani, they could do that. And I think if they sent a letter to the Al Thani telling them that they'd done it, they should expect a check. <laughs> There, there you go. News you could use. So I'm sure the United States would feel great if their ally in the Middle East were a lot like Canada, but they're not. That's not the Middle East. That's not reality. Are there areas, I mean, you wrote this article in Foreign Policy, the Qatar problem. You spelled it out. Um, Here's where the uh, Qataris have been less than great allies. Here are some cases like Libya where they're are pretty much actively working against the United States. Are there areas of particular concern and particular opposition to U.S. foreign policy? Yeah, I think that there are a few areas. I mean, I should preface it by saying that I think it's probably not useful to look upon Qatar as either an enemy or a friend. We have a very transactional relationship with Qatar, the United States does. And that means that uh, we have to look upon every dealing with with Qatar on its own merits because we're not forming a sort of this type of strategic relationship that we have with Canada with the Qataris. And I think we've some of the transactions have worked out pretty well. You mentioned a couple of them and the release of Bowie Berg Dahl is another example. Some of the transactions have worked out very badly. I think some of the ones that have worked out badly are Qatar's support for Hamas, which is very, very unpopular in Washington these days. Qatar's activities in Syria, in which they've funded a large parts of the opposition, uh, including some extremist elements, I hasten to add, not ISIS, but some of the other extremist elements. And as, I, as you mentioned, Qatar's activities in Libya, which really uh, helped prevent the Libyans from being able to form an effective government after Gaddafi fell, and I think contributed to the chaos that we see in Libya now. If you were working for the State Department, you would have to look at them through their eyes. You would maybe do a little game theory and see what's in their interests. What are some things that you might point out to the Qataris that w- might change course that actually you could sell as being in their interest? I'm a little bit tired of pointing out to the Qataris what are, what's in their interest. I want to bring forward with the Qataris some of the ways in which uh, we are helping them in which they need the United States, and to be a little bit coercive about the problem. You mentioned the very large air base in Qatar, and and you mentioned it in the way that U.S. officials usually mention it, with what an advantage it is for the United States that we have an air base in Qatar. You know, screw that. Uh, It's an advantage to Qatar to have that U.S. air base there. They are incredibly unpopular with all of their neighbors. They are essentially a defenseless state it's incredibly rich, and you would think in, in sort of previous historical times, ripe for plunder. But nobody plunders them because they are protected by the United States. That is a huge benefit that the United States gives to Qatar, and we should be getting more for it. We could pick maybe a couple rebel groups in Syria and say, that's it, no more funding of them. Or we could say simply, look, if you want to fund rebel groups, uh, hand us the money and we'll find the appropriate place to put it. And we'll definitely mention to them that it came from Qatar. Is Qatar a better ally, transactional as they are for the United States, than Saudi Arabia? Neither, frankly, are good allies, but for very different reasons. 
Uh, Saudi Arabia has been a little bit easier to deal with on the on some of the issues that uh, I mentioned, in part because they're less sort of revolutionary. They're so uh, careful and so sclerotic uh, in their decision making that they very rarely do anything rash and actually very rarely do anything at all. Is Qatar a better ally for the United States than Jordan? Certainly not. But I think that the again the reason there. Jordan is much more reliant on the United States and recognizes itself as so, largely because it simply doesn't have the oil or gas wealth that Qatar has, which gives it a tremendous amount of independence and a tremendous amount of ability to, in the in the Arab world, and to drive political uh, developments in the Arab world. And there was a time when I would have asked you about Egypt, but uh, I think I did run out of Muslim uh, countries to uh, <laughs> reasonably ask the question about. And that tells you something about Qatar, right? Yeah, I think it it tells you in general something about the difficulty that the U.S. is having across the region, really. I mean, it's uh, at the the sort of the time in which we can sort of simply operate effectively with these countries who are so at odds with our values and so, frankly, at odds with our long-term vision for the region and for the developments in their own societies. I think it's becoming more and more difficult. Jeremy Shapiro is a fellow in the Brookings Foreign Policy Program, and in Foreign Relations Magazine, he wrote an interesting article called The Qatar Problem. Thank you. Thank you for having me. These days, you could get anything on demand, like iced tea. You know what flavors are available in iced tea? All of them. Every flavor of anything anyone has ever thought of, you can get an iced tea based on that flavor. Weirdly, there's almost no food product that is iced tea flavored. Now, obviously, what is iced tea flavor? Iced is the cold part, tea is the flavor. So there are tons of things that are tea flavored. But I was looking into this. Do you know they don't even have iced tea flavored ice cream? There's tons of tea flavored ice cream, but no one calls it iced tea flavored ice cream. Anyway, I say this because I'm thinking about demand, thinking about everything that you can demand, and I'm trying to think of what are the exceptions to this. The post office. The post office is an exception. You got to deal with their hours. Maybe you got to deal with their lines. You got to do what they say. No, you don't. No, you don't. You can get postage on demand with stamps.com. You can buy and print official U.S. postage for any package or any letter. You could do it using your own computer and your own printer. It never closes. It's there 24-7. I mean, it's up to you. If you want to close your printer, it'll be closed. So we have a special offer here. If you use the promo code, the gist, you qualify for a no-risk trial plus a $110 bonus offer. They'll give you a digital scale and up to $55 in free postage. So don't wait. Go to stamps.com. Before you do anything else, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage and type in the gist. That's stamps.com. Enter the gist. This summer, staffers from the House of Representatives stopped by the National Science Foundation to check up on things. The NSF's mission is to advance the progress of science, a mission accomplished by funding proposals for research and education made by scientists. That's from their official statement. But these House staffers weren't into advancement. They were trying to force the NSF into retreat. They've been checking into the NSF in an attempt to find, if not smoking guns, at least grist for the mill to discredit the science the NSF was funding. The Republicans who control the House Committee on Science are intent on demonstrating that many of the grants are a waste and the Democrats are playing defense. Chronicling this is Jeffrey Mervis, who covers science policy for the journal Science. Hello, Jeffrey. Hi, Mike. Is this new? Is this a uh, tactic that had not been tried before? Uh, Well, that's a good question. Let me uh, step back a minute just to paint a picture for readers. As you said, NSF funds $7 billion a year of research. It's the largest supporter of academic research uh, outside the biomedical field. Uh, And the way it does that is through grants to scientists who submit proposals. They fund about 11,000 of them a year, and they're reviewed by scientists who are experts in those fields. So what was a surprise to scientists is not that members of Congress were critical, but that information that has always been confidential was now being made available to congressional staff. What was the confidential part? 
what was re- is being reviewed is everything connected to the grant itself. This includes the proposal. This includes reviews by experts, in other words, commenting on how good the research is and whether they think it's of value. Any correspondence between program managers, staffers at NSF, and the investigators, and anything else that relates to the grant-making process. Now, what's the concern if uh, confidentiality is breached? How would that affect the science? How would that negatively affect the science? What's, what are they worried about? Well, what they're worried about is that people won't be willing to serve as reviewers and speak freely about their opinions if it becomes public that Professor X said such and such about Professor Y proposals. There's also the issue of intellectual property, as it were. If I'm a scientist who has a great idea and I submit it to NSF and it's not funded, I want to keep that idea because I may want to try to get funding elsewhere. Or even if it is funded, I want time to work on that idea. And that's all in in the files that these congressional staffers are now going through. Right. Now, the chairman of the House Committee on Science is Lamar Smith of Texas. And his committee, under his aegis, has put out press releases that have been dismissive of some studies that the NSF has done. I'll read some of one titled, Smith, Don't Reward NSF's Frivolous Use of Taxpayer Money with More Money. In this press release talks about the NSF pays a researcher more than $227,000 to thumb through pictures of animals in old National Geographic magazines. And they list some other research that they're deriding, like oppression and mental health in Nepal, $160,000. Tort law slash slavery in colonial Peru, $50,000. Regulation of China's dairy industry, $152,000. Now, I have to say... I hear those things, and I think it's supposed to get my goat, get me riled up. Like, why are we wasting money on researching mental health in Nepal? It doesn't even strike me as that's something that we wouldn't want to learn. Why wouldn't we want to learn that? I know you've actually talked to some of these researchers. What do they say? Right. No, and I think a good example, along uh, with the ones you mentioned, is a grant that was derided as studying how people ride a bicycle. Yeah. The title, Human Control of Bicycle Dynamics. Uh, But when I talked to the researcher, he said, well, when you think about it for a minute, you realize it's easy to learn to ride a bicycle. Everybody knows how to do that. But it's very hard to explain how we do it. In other words, what is the interaction between the person and the machine? And he said, if you substitute pilot for rider for example, and you substitute airplane for bicycle, you start to realize that that's a really important relationship to understand, and improving it could reduce risks, improve performance, promote economic growth, and even protect the country. But you can't capture that in a 12 word title. Is there anything else that the efforts of uh, the Republicans on this committee are leading up to? Canceling some grants? pre-mocking studies before they're even done? Yes. I think the concern by a lot of scientists and scientific leaders is that the committee is trying to eliminate funding in whole areas, in particular the social and behavioral and economic sciences. Now, Mr. Smith says he is just doing due diligence, and it's the responsibility of the committee to make sure that all the research is in the national interest. That phrase, the national interest, obviously can mean a lot of things, and it can mean different things to different people. So what scientists are concerned about is that that this is a stalking horse and that if the science committee finds enough individual examples, it can convince members to say, well, let's just eliminate that entire program to make sure that we don't fund any research that some people may consider wasteful. The other issue is, that scientists raise is who's in the best position to decide what is good research and what is wasteful. And they would argue that this system at NSF and at other agencies has worked pretty well over 60 or 70 years, and that substituting a politician's view for the view of experts is probably not a good idea. 
Right. Now, there is one research project that has been widely derided, uh, especially uh, in conservative circles, and it was uh, it's reduced to a musical about global warming, a musical about climate change. What can you tell me about that one? What's interesting about that to some people is that everyone agrees that you have to take risks when you fund research, and not all projects work. The problem, of course, is if something doesn't work the way a researcher expects, do you chalk it up as a lesson learned and move on, or do you point to it as wasteful spending? In this case, this was a play that opened in Kansas City, moved to New York, and closed sooner than the director and the actors had hoped. But is it a failure or is it just an example of trying to do something new in order to deal with an important issue? Again, it comes down to a pretty subjective view in that case. Yeah. It's only gone to the extent, and I'm surprised you didn't mention the shrimp on a treadmill, because that's another recent famous one, is, you know, somebody gets up in the floor of Congress and says, I can't believe NSF is spending money you know, to train shrimp on a treadmill. And what was the purpose of the shrimp? Well, that had to do with locomotion for animals that were affected by climate change. And the way to do that, they came up with a very ingenious way of actually measuring the amount of energy that they use when they're going from one place to another. They created this mini treadmill. Have you seen it? Does it really look like a treadmill? (laughs) Uh... (laughs) Well, to the extent, I mean, if you can imagine it's sort of a krill-like creature, and it's not a mechanical device that's measuring how it moves. Yeah, well, and good, good thing it wasn't an elliptical machine, since shrimps have no arms. <laughs> yeah, and the, I, I don't know if there was a musical soundtrack. I mean, you're <laughs> right, you know, there could have been some questions about that. Jeffrey Mervis covers science for the journal Science. Thanks so much for talking with us. Thanks for having me, Mike. And now the spiel. Well, this is actually a pre-spiel. I just want to set the scene. This was in the Regency Ballroom in San Francisco. Happened yesterday, last night. I flew in to do this show the day of. That's really all the context you need. Enjoy. And now the spiel. So I was... I was going to San Francisco... And of course, I had to think of this song, If You're Going to San Francisco. Do you know this horror show? This abomination of lyrics and melody? If you're going to San Francisco. Written by John Phillips of the Mamas and the Papas, sung by Scott McKenzie. It reached number four in the Billboard Hot 100. Here's something that Wikipedia says. The single is purported to have sold over seven million copies worldwide. I guess they couldn't count that accurately back then. And it also says, the song is credited with bringing thousands of young people to San Francisco, California during the late 60s. I'd have gone with the drugs first. Maybe drugs, free love, then the song. Well, drugs, free love, a message of social justice. Well, drugs, free love, message of social justice, other better bands singing other better songs, then other different drugs, and then maybe the drugs, and then maybe that song brought people to San Francisco. But what this song brings to mind to me is the albatross, the yoke of having a totally unloved and totally pointless municipal anthem, an unasked for municipal anthem. Now, some cities have anthems. I mean, I'm from New York. Obviously, we have a number of good songs. In fact, so many songs about New York that each month in New York gets its own song. I like New York in June. How about you? Specific Parts of New York get their own song. The sidewalks of New York get their own song. But if you go down the list, as I have, of the top 10 metropolitan areas in the United States, you find that some have had unwanted municipal anthems thrust upon them. I count Los Angeles, the Randy Newman song, I Love L.A., and you have to sing that if you're in Los Angeles, and when the Dodgers win, they sing it. But you know what? In L.A., they don't really love L.A., It's way too cheery a song for what the locals actually think. Now, if we go to the third most populous um, city or municipal area in the United States, Chicago, Naperville, Elgin, some parts of Wisconsin, 
You have Chicago. Lots of great songs about Chicago. My kind of town, Chicago is. But then you have, perhaps by now, an unwanted municipal anthem. I'm thinking of the song Toddlin' Town. Not so much the anthem, not so much the song, not that bad. Really just one line in the song. I saw a man, he danced with his wife in Chicago. Chicago, my home. I saw a man, he danced with his wife. This is notable somehow. I saw a guy, he was combing his hair in Chicago. I saw a fella walking with two feet that's so specific to Chicago. The fourth and fifth biggest municipal areas are Houston and Dallas, and they don't actually have their own city songs, but I've been to a number of uh, Texas Rangers games, and they do a little of this in Houston, too. They sing the... Deep in the heart of Texas. Of course, you could always zing them with this a little bit, like um, by noting that on Friday, a federal court upheld a pretty draconian law which says that if doctors don't have admitting privileges, they can't perform abortions. So this means that for many, many people, they've shut down most abortion clinics, and it will take you six, seven hours to drive to get proper medical care if you want an abortion. And if you're living deep in the heart of Texas. Washington, D.C. lacks a song. Stephen Merritt of Magnetic Fields wrote one. It's cute. Philadelphia has Philadelphia Freedom. That's pretty good. Miami has some songs. Really, the one that really stands out on the list is lacking any sort of anthem is Atlanta. Not a lot of good things rhyme with Atlanta. Atlanta, Atlanta, we're given to drawing out our banter. Atlanta, Atlanta, this song is best sung by a cantor. It doesn't really work. The 10th biggest municipal statistical area and the songs about it is Boston. And Boston has this great song by the Standells, which is really great. And in many ways, the mirror image to I Love L.A. Let's hear a little of that. So in L.A., they have a beautiful city, but they hate it. In Boston, they're acknowledging the decrepitude of their town, but they love it. It really does speak to the Boston character. And so now we land on the 11th biggest metropolitan statistical area. It is San Francisco. They have this horrible hippie dreck. But luckily, what does San Francisco have in its favor? It has the quintessential municipal anthem, first sung in 1961 at the Fairmont Hotel, not a mile from this venue. It is, of course, I left my heart in San Francisco. And it's the sort of thing that you could sing at a ball game or you could sing to each other. And it not, wasn't originally recorded by Tony. Tony Bennett, but just hearing it makes you feel warm, unlike San Francisco, but, it, but you'll understand the appeal. So if we could go out on a little of that song. When I come home to you. It's the way he does it. San Francisco. Sing it, Tony. Your golden sun will shine for me. If you're going to San Francisco, let this be the song in your heart. All right, thanks. That's it for today's show. Andrea Salenzi produces the gist. She's never been jet lagged, but she has been lollygag gagged. That's when she was bound by a previously existing agreement not to speak of a co-worker's laziness. That co-worker was not Andy Bowers, who is executive producer of Slate Podcasts. He was once so tired, he forgot where he parked his car in Germany, so he just left the country without finding it. Actually, that was me. That actually happened. True story. We're on iTunes. We're on SoundCloud. On iTunes, give us a review. Do something else with us on iTunes or anywhere else that you listen to The Gist. This is my short pledge drive spiel. Sign someone up for The Gist. If you listen to The Gist and know someone who would like it, don't just recommend it. Grab their phone and actually download The Gist for them. This is the most helpful thing you could do. It helps the show to an immense degree. And I know that you want to evangelize on our behalf. We really thank you for doing that. We are on Facebook.com slash Slate Gist. Our Twitter feed is Slate Gist. Email the gist at Slate.com. You can sign up for an email that comes to your inbox at Slate.com slash Gist email. And we're also on Yo. I want to plug 
our two live shows on Wednesday. I will be in Brooklyn with Hang Up and Listen. Come out. We'll be talking sports with Roy Blunt Jr., the author. The Slate Culture Fest, same day, this Wednesday, the 8th, will have two guests live in L.A., One's Natasha Leone, the other is Jenny Slate. Funny, in this case, also meta. Slate.com slash live has all the information about both of those events. You know, I've gone into so much sleep debt, I'm actually under sleep water. So I'm just going to walk away from my body. I'm going to let squatters rummage inside here and eventually set up a meth lab in my sternum. It can happen. Thanks for listening.